Hey y'all, welcome back to Bible Studies for Life. I'm glad you joined us again. If you have your book, grab it and open it up to the first session. If you don't, you can pick one up at the church or you can open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 20 for today and that's where we're going to be. We'll also be in Psalm 16. So getting into the study today, our lesson is written by Tony Evans. If you have your book and he is, let me find him again. He's the pastor of Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship and the president of the Urban Alternative. Now, the commentary writer, which is what I'll be referring to quite a bit, is Greg Miller, and he's involved at Celebration Church in Houston, Georgia, and he's a former editor at Lifeway Resources. So today's lesson, as we I said, we'll be looking at the Ten Commandments in this next series. Today's is putting God first. And the point of the lesson is that God is to have first place in every aspect of our life. Now, the writer says, if you have your book on page 14, that we've all felt disappointed, frustrated, hurt, or confused at one time or another. Life comes with issues, and these issues can show up in many ways. When enough issues arise, life begins to feel like one big mess. Been there, done that, if you haven't. Now, he also goes on to tell us a story about a man who was having problems with everything on his body. Well, come to find out, one issue was causing everything else to hurt, and it happened to be his finger when he was pointing. Everywhere was hurting, but it was actually his finger that was hurting. Now, kind of a silly story to remind us that sometimes we have everything going on around us and we feel like the whole world's falling apart and it is literally sometimes in our lives but the writer says that the good news is for that man it was actually just one problem and sometimes the good news for us is it's actually just one problem it's that we're not giving God the place he deserves in our lives now not always not always but that's kind of the point of this lesson that we're gonna kind of stay in that boat today um there's one solution sometimes that can change everything, and that is the fact that we've lost touch with who really is the first person in our life and should be the first person in our life, and that's God. So even though it seems like everything might be a mess, we should trust Him and put Him first. Now, in our commentary, I'm going to read you a quick paragraph before we get started that kind of sets the scene and the tone for this Exodus 20 passage. He says, anything or anyone might be your God. For some people, their God is money, their career, pleasure, sports, or a special possession. Unfortunately, these gods, these things we place above all else, are rampant in our society. The Bible calls this idolatry, the giving to someone or something else, the devotion and worship that God alone deserves. God calls us to devote ourselves to him because he alone is God. In him alone is found true life, both in this world and in the world to come. Now, if you have your Bibles, open up to Exodus chapter 20, just like I said, and we're going to read verses 1 through 6 to start this lesson today. Then God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the place of slavery. Do not have God, other gods besides me. Do not make an idol for yourself, whether in the shape of anything, in the heavens above or the earth below, or in the waters under the earth. Do not bow and worship to them, and do not serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for their father's iniquity to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing faithful love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commands." Now, in verses 1 and 2, um, Moses here is talking. Let me give you a real quick background of this. Moses is the writer of this passage here. And God is reminding him on he's on Mount Sinai about to give Moses the Ten Commandments. God's reminding him to go down and tell the Israelites that he delivered them from slavery, from Egypt. He led them through the Red Sea on dry land um, to this area, and Moses is now speaking with him or listening to him on Mount Sinai. And God met with the Israelites. He revealed himself to them. He told them how they were supposed to live, and now he's going to give them this covenant that they're supposed to have with him. 
Now, centuries later, we're going to look at Psalm 16, where David is the author, and we're going to kind of tie those two passages together and emphasize how God's supposed to have first place in our lives. But back to Exodus chapter 20 here, um, Moses is listening to God speak here, and God refers to himself as the Lord. And he's emphasizing his self-existence, his ever-present and unchanging nature to Moses. He's reminding him who he is. He's God. And the Hebrew word for God here just reflects the mystery of God, the majesticness of God, and the eternal nature of him. And he's just, first of all, setting the scene. Hey, look at me, Moses. I'm God. I'm the one who created you, the one who made you. And the one who saw you and the Israelites suffering all this time in Egypt, crying out to me for help. And I re relieved you of that bondage. I brought you out of Egypt. And here I'm going to make a new covenant with you. And that's why I took Moses up on the mountain. Now in verse 3 is where God introduces the first command to Moses. And this first command reflects an inward focus for us. It's a look at our heart, and he's telling Moses here, or reminding us here even, that there's no way we could even think of obeying the other nine commandments if we don't have this first one right, because the motivation to obeying the other commands is to love God and serve Him. If we choose to love God and serve Him and put Him first, then the other ones will come freely out of our motivation to serve God. Now in verses 4 and 5, he tells them, don't make an idol for yourself. And the Hebrew word for idol here is used to describe an actual physical image, okay? Like a carved, shaped, molded image. And usually these images that they made were depicting the invisible God that whatever it was they were trying to worship and they were essential to their practices to their worship practices and they were almost in every religion that there was in all the ancient times so people would actually physically bow down to these things that they created with their hands and they typically represented some form of nature whether it be an animal or um, a tree, you know, like a physical thing in nature. They reflected some sort of nature. Ironically enough, God was the one who created these images that they were creating with their hands that they were going to bow down and worship. So there's a lot of things going on here. And God's just reminding Moses here to tell the Egyptian, I mean, the Israelites, don't worship these things. Don't bow down to them. Just worship me. I'm the one who created you, who heard you, who called out to me, and I delivered you. So people would physically bow down to these things and God's commanding them against this. Don't do this. Now the verses, the end of verse 5 and on into verse 6, um, it elaborates into the second, elaborates on the second command where the Lord said he's a jealous God. And the jealous interpretation here actually could be interpreted zealous, um, not necessarily jealous. Um, N.T. Wright was saying just this week in something I was listening to of his that if you only speak one language, which typically, um, more than likely, most of you all who are listening today speak one language, you might speak a little bit of another one, but you're not necessarily fluent in it. Um, you interpret things one way, the English way, and it's hard for you to interpret anything else any other way or even think of it because you have one idea and people who are very versed in language studies understand that a particular term may be different may be a different interpretation so just think of that when you're studying scripture the way we think of jealous is not necessarily what is meant here think of zealous and the writer here brings that out Zealous means a great love and concern. And so God here is giving them a great, he's saying, I'm zealous of you. I have a great love for you, a great concern for you. And because I do, I want you to turn away from these idols that you're worshiping. And he says here that those who turn away from God will face the consequences of their sin. 
So if you don't worship me and me alone and you turn to these other idols or other gods, you'll face consequences for, for that and it will succeed to generations and generations. Now, he's not literally saying here that he's going to punish your children for something you did. What this verse means is that there's ongoing consequences of your sin, of an individual's sin. And sometimes that is brought out later on in later generations. Also, this is another way of saying that continuing consequences of a person's sin is frequently repeated by their children or their grandchildren. Because I know I've said before that what we do is actually what our children do, not what we tell them to do because more is caught than taught. We can teach and say and, and just drill it in them all we want, but what they actually do is follow our example. So what you're doing in life is what your children will catch and start to act on and start to do. So in this situation, if you're living in a lifestyle of sin, that's what they see and that's what they start to do as well in certain circumstances. But the opposite of that is that those who love God and keep His commands, He's going to show them faithful love to a thousand generations. Now, somewhere that first cycle of having discipline for the father's sins and, and having to bear those consequences, somewhere that cycle's got to break. And we as children of God can be the ones who stand in the gap for the children who are not being taught the right way and who are not having a great example for them. We can stand in the gap. We can teach them and show them the right, the right way to live. And because of that, we can break that cycle. And then they can come into this obedience cycle where God pours his blessings on these kids. And it says those who love God and keep his commands can have a longer lasting impact on their descendants. And he, Jesus, will show his faithful love to a thousand generations. And the words love and hate here don't refer to emotions, but rather to loyalty and disloyalty to God's covenant, obedience or disobedience to his commands. So putting God first may not always come naturally to us. Sometimes we get it right and sometimes we miss the mark. Sin is missing the mark. Sometimes we do it the right way, sometimes we don't. But we put God first because He is God, because He alone is God. We don't need these made up idols. Now, the writer brings out of our commentary that in our culture, we don't bow down to wooden idols or statues typically. Typically. The people I'm speaking to right now typically do not bow down to wooden idols or statues. We don't declare our allegiance through rituals or in through sacrifices. But while the absence of those things, the rituals, the sacrifices, the wooden idols, are actually a good thing, it can also be very misleading because we don't physically and tangibly bow down to a person or a possession. We can naively think that, we aren't, that there aren't idols in our lives, and we mistakenly believe that God is first in our lives. What does it look like to place God first in today's culture? It looks like living countercultural. It looks like saying, hmm, I think that I want to do this. And, and you just lay it out like, I don't know, plan for the future in some sort of way. But when you're planning for the future, you're only actually planning it for you and your family. My four, no more. Um, it could be, I don't know, just, I mean, let the Holy Spirit tell you what it is for you, but whatever it is, it's only including you and what you desire. It's not including the ideas that God has for your life. And it says here in the book, before God gave the Ten Commands, he first reminded the Israelites what he had done for them. How do things in our lives become idols? We put things before God. We begin to do things for ourselves, 
rather than doing things for God or for other people. Well, in the next verses we're going to look at in Psalm 16, we're going to look at how David focuses on how God, is, God alone is good and completely trustworthy. So in Psalm 16, verses 1 through 4, David says, Protect me, God, for I take refuge in you. I said to the Lord, You are my Lord. I have nothing good besides you. As for the holy people who are in the land, they are the noble ones. All my delight is in them. The sorrows of those who take another God for themselves will multiply. Now, David was described as a man after God's own heart. If you know anything about David, you know that he sinned. He messed up. He missed the mark. He made mistakes. But from his writings and his lifestyle, we discover that David knew God in a way that many people never experienced God. And even though he did miss the mark, sin, make mistakes, he always turned back and repented of those. And David was a warrior. He was a fighter. But in these verses, he asked God to protect him. Well, that's kind of silly to think, well, he's a warrior. He's asking God to protect him. We might think that maybe. Um, the Hebrew word for protect was a shepherd keeping a flock. That's an example. Or a bodyguard defending someone's life. And then he talks about how that he takes refuge in God. A refuge is a trusted place of protection during times of distress. You may know someone who you can go to as a refuge. Um, Jesus ultimately is our refuge, but you may have someone that reflects Jesus so much that physically and tangibly that's who you run to because you find safety and security in their presence when you're going through something distressful. When verse 2, it says, David didn't go to God only when he needed something, but his reputation, his relationship with God was growing and ongoing. Um, he often asked God to take refuge. He often asked, can I take refuge in you? I'm coming to you. I'm turning to you. And this just symbolized his relationship with God, that he was constantly coming to God for um, support and for love. And then in this verse, he also acknowledged that he had nothing good besides the Lord. David had many wonderful things. He was a wealthy man. He was the king. But he acknowledged that God and his relationship with God was the most important. All these other things just were icing on the cake and nothing compared to him. Well, in verse 3, David talked about the holy people, literally the holy ones. And the Hebrew word for holy can refer to heavenly beings or earthly beings. So to clarify it, David said in verse 3, as for the holy people who are in the land. So he's talking about people that are actually living among him who are holy. Now this word, um, holy, like I said, it, it refers to um, humans or angelic beings. And these were possibly the Israelites who were set apart by God, which we just read about from Moses. And David would call these people noble. The word can mean majestic, excellent, or magnificent. The word noble can. And David loved these faithful people, and he noted that his delight was in him, was in them. And in verse 4, David called the attention to those who take another God for themselves, and he references the pagan nations here. And these were the people of Israel who had turned away from God, or possibly just the pagans in general. And he talks about the first, the first of the Ten Commandments, which would forbid God's people and all the people in the land from having another God besides Yahweh. And he says in the commentary, rather than receiving the increasing blessings that come from being devoted to God, these people who follow other gods would experience only sorrows that multiply. Um, the commentary writer also says that he gives us a couple things here. He says, Satan wants us to focus on the pain rather than the purpose. Satan sought to confuse Paul by giving him a thorn in the flesh. Paul could have blamed God for the difficulty that he was facing rather than looking to God in the midst of the difficulty that he was facing. And Satan also seeks to plant doubts about the goodness of God by tempting us to develop a victim mentality. 
Satan attempted this with Job by striking down and destroying all the people and things Job loved and cherished, and then wreaking havoc on Job's health. But Job remained steadfast, ultimately trusting in the goodness of God over the situation that he was in. Scripture assumes that all things will be used for good when we love God and put him first. Whether it's the oxygen that we're breathing or the food that we're eating or the ability for our bodies to function. Um, that God never pauses from giving good things to us. Now, these verses and this writing here about Satan focusing, asking us to focus, um, I'm sorry, Satan tempting us to focus on the pain rather than the purpose and placing doubts in our mind about the goodness of God. I can say that that happens a lot here in my own life, and I'm sure it happens a lot with you too, that we can get so caught up in focusing on the situation that it's hard to see that God's got any good in it going on whatsoever. Um, there's a whole bunch of situations just this week in my life personally that I know about um, personally know the people that it's happening to and somewhat personally know them through their family members and literally um, a 46 year man year old man died of COVID um, who has children and very young grandchildren um, a girl who's going through a very tragic situation right now um, physically in pain and in the hospital recovering. Um, another couple who's going through an emotional tragedy right now in their own life. So it's hard to see the good through all of this. And it's hard to not focus on what Satan puts in front of us and see the pain rather than the purpose. And they, these people do not need you and I telling them Oh, God's got a plan for you and God's going to fix it all. Yeah. Yeah. That is true. But it's for them to deal with, to battle, and for us to pray and lift them up through it. It's not for us to try to fix it for them. And instead, what I mentioned earlier about the refuge, a refuge, a trusted place of protection during times of distress, we should be the refuge for people. Are you a refuge? Can other people come to you when you're in distress? And God, if he's first in your life, you can say that truly you can be a refuge for someone. You're going to mess up. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to sin, miss the mark. But if you keep coming back to God, you can be a refuge for people. And think of your refugees. I mean, think of your refuge. And you're a refugee and you run to them. And that's what God is. If you put him first, he's your refuge. You run to him in times of distress. But then you can also be a refuge for other people to run to. Now, we're going to skip over verses 5 through 8 in Psalm 19. But I see I'm at the 23 mark already. I'm so sorry. We're going to jump right into this. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My body also rests securely. For you will not abandon me to Sheol. You will not allow your faithful one to see decay. You reveal the path of life to me, and your presence is abundant joy. Yet at your right hand are eternal pleasures. In verses 5 through 8, which we skipped over, David mentioned some of the blessings he experienced in this life from his relationship with the Lord. He was his counselor. He was his guide. He was his ever-present source of strength and security. David knew there was more to life than being mortal earthly existence than what we had here on earth so then he connects it and he says therefore based on the fact that you have a relationship with the lord because of his relationship with god he says my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices his body rests securely and the the word here for rest means to dwell or abide to have some safety there Securely means to put your confidence in and to fully trust in God. He didn't fear anything that came in this life or in the afterlife because he rested securely in Jesus. And his main focus here is especially evident in verse 10 where he says, The Father didn't abandon Jesus to the grave, to decay. 
in the body, which is the process that happens after being buried. But he says in verse 11 that, um, that God revealed the path of life to him. And the Old Testament refers to life in terms of paths. And you had the path of life and the path of death. And the path of life, which was obedience, where you got the path of death, which is rejection to God. And you travel the path leading to death. Um, skipping over a lot of the things that were in your book, you could go back and read about the GPS example and the verbal direction example. Um, but it's God alone who provides that which is most valuable to us, eternal life. But that isn't all. David also took the time to mention some of the blessings that he had experienced from God. And we can do that in our own life. We can mention and think of all the blessings that we've experienced from God. And, in, and this is how we can do that. God's way isn't merely one of the ways. It's the only way to heaven. And it's the only way to abundant joy and eternal pleasure. And when we remain in Jesus and we align ourselves under him, he will open doors that we didn't even have the ability to knock on. And he'll overcome the obstacles that all of our emotions might dig up. An eternal life is a gift that we receive by placing our faith in Jesus for the payment of our sins. So, you have Moses and then you have David. Moses had presented the Israelites with two options, life and prosperity or death and diversity. And he was telling them that life would come from loving God and from if you turned away from God it would lead to death and destruction and then David's words that we just read in Psalm 16 remind us that that life is finite that it's fragile and that we need to focus on the goodness of God and put him first so that we can have him as our refuge in times of trouble but also so that we can be a refuge for people when they're going through things in life. So this week, we need to recognize our idols. Nail them down. Figure out what they are. And it honestly acknowledge what we need to change. What we need to ask God to help us to change in our lives. We need to run from those distractions. When you recognize the idol, you're going to get distracted with that idol. So you need to run from the distractions. Find something else to focus on. Um... Figure out a plan. Make a plan for turning away from that distraction. So, I'm sorry that I went away over my time here this week. But don't think of putting God first as some cliche thing. It's actually just a moment-by-moment -moment decision. It's just like David did. Miss the mark. Turn. Repent. Repent. Do something else. Get away from that distraction and move on. It's sinning and missing the mark and then saying, okay, God, how can I get back on track? Because it is a daily surrender, a moment-by-moment -moment surrender, and that's how we put God first. Let's pray, and I'll see you next week. Thank you, dear Jesus, for this lesson and for the reminder of how we have to daily and moment-by-moment -moment put our trust and our faith in you in order to put you first in our lives. Thank you for your word and thank you for this lesson. Amen.